When we're looking at prostate cancer statistics on the internet, the first thing that comes up is the American Cancer Society. And they say that there's a 99% survival rate out to five years with those newly diagnosed with prostate cancer. Well, a lot of people are wondering, what are the nuances of that? What if you have metastatic activity already? Does your Gleason score matter? Does your PSA matter? Well, today we're gonna answer those questions with Dr. Mark Schulz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist who's focused solely in prostate cancer. And we're gonna find out more about these statistics. So today, Dr. Scholz, we're answering questions that we received in our comment section on life expectancy. Now, this is a varying topic because there's different types of prostate cancer, but what we're going to do is contextualize certain situations and the questions that were asked. And I'm going to start with a main question that we get quite often. The American Cancer Society talks about a 99% survival rate five years out of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I think a lot of people are wondering, okay, five years, 99%, like that sounds great, but there's other people who seem to get prostate cancer to a more severe degree and they do not have that same five-year rate. So what really is the difference in between these different cases? So what you're really asking is if we have 99% five-year survival and if we have 100,000 people uh, who are diagnosed, it's actually 200,000 people that are diagnosed every single year with prostate cancer, one out of 100 are going to die within five years, according to that statistic. 100,000, that would be 1,000 people who die. And if it's 200,000, it'd be 2,000 people who die within five years. Dying within five years uh, with prostate cancer is very uncommon. It almost invariably indicates it was someone who wasn't checking their PSA and comes to the doctor and their PSA is in the hundreds or the thousands and there's cancer throughout the bones. That kind of thing happens actually pretty frequently. So even those individuals don't usually die within five years, but a small subgroup of them have a hormone resistant form that uh, doesn't respond to the typical Lupron uh, Xtandi type medications. And as a result, then the already advanced disease progresses within five years and then they su succumb to the disease. Prostate cancer is so common, we all tend to hear about these scenarios. So one, even one person who dies of prostate cancer is news because there's millions of people that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. As you already pointed out, the common assumption is that prostate cancer is one illness when really it's a myriad of different illnesses called prostate cancer that behave differently. Some are responsive to treatment, some are less responsive to treatment. Uh, they're genetically d distinct, just as different types of skin cancers. Melanoma is a type of s skin cancer. Squamous cell or basal cell is a type of skin cancer. In the prostate world, we number these different types of cancers, which makes it sound like they're sort of interrelated, but they're not. They're very distinct. So I don't. That's a long answer to your question, but I think people do need a context about the fact that there are many different types of prostate cancer. There are people who unfortunately never did PSA screening, and when they show up at the doctor's office, the disease is very advanced. And then a small subgroup of those people have a genetic variant of prostate cancer that's resistant to hormone treatment, and the disease is not controllable, and they will succumb within the first five years. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that this September we're having an in-person prostate cancer patients and caregivers conference. It's a great way to get your questions answered by world-renowned experts. You can learn more at our website, pcri.org. Now, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel because we come out with new prostate cancer videos every week, and it's a great way to support our channel. And another way you can support PCRI is by donating, and you can do that at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schulz. So what I hear you saying is that when it comes to somebody who does fall into that, you know, 2,000 men out of 200,000, that 1%, that they already have metastatic disease all over their body and that they are hormone, that small fraction could be hormone resistant. How many of these men are really hormone resistant from the get-go? It depends on, quote, how bad the disease is when it's diagnosed. If people have one or two metastatic lesions, almost none are hormone resistant from the get-go. But if someone comes in with a PSA of 2,000 and they've got 80 spots of cancer around their body, interestingly, not all of them will have early hormone resistance. Some of those will. Over half of the men who come in with a very dire situation uh, over 80 spots spread throughout the bones and the lymph nodes, will go into a remission where they're, when they embark upon hormone treatment, their PSA will drop down to undetectable levels, less than 0.1, we call that a low PSA nadir. 
and have pretty optimistic 10-year survival rates because they have a genetic variant of prostate cancer that succumbs to the hormone deprivation. Hormone deprivation, testosterone blockade, androgen deprivation is far and away one of the most powerful anti-cancer maneuvers in the whole cancer world. Works only for prostate cancer, but it is insanely effective and far better than most types of chemotherapy. So it's not surprising that we would define the future in any specific individual based on how well the treatment works. So if you have a dangerous disease, the only thing that's going to save you is an effective treatment. And if the treatment is effective, what was initially a, a frightening and advanced disease will melt away and go into remission. If another individual with a different genetic variant of advanced prostate cancer embarks upon testosterone deprivation therapy and the disease remits a little bit but you don't get it all, that means that there are cancer cells that are just laughing at the hormone deprivation and saying, you can't touch me, and those are the ones that will define the future, progress, grow, multiply, and create problems down the line. And those are the ones, the bad outcomes that we hear about. So going back to the American Cancer Society's statistics of 99%, let's say somebody walks into a doctor's office, they get their PSA checked, and the cancer's localized. It's not very you know, advanced. It's a pretty much small tumor, but when they get the biopsy, it comes back as nine or 10. Do those five year 99% survival rates still apply to a Gleason nine and 10 patient? I would argue in my experience that the survival rates for someone who comes in with localized disease, and of course, we're even more confident now with these PSMA PET scans that there isn't metastatic disease present. It's essentially impossible to die within five years from localized prostate cancer, even with Gleason 9 or 10. Could someone over the next 10, 15 years die of uh, progressive prostate cancer? A small percentage perhaps, but most of these men are gonna be cured with initial therapy. They'll live a normal life expectancy. The f ones that aren't cured, the fail-safes and the backup plans with PSMA PET scans, spot radiation, hormone treatments, and other methods are so effective that uh, I still believe that almost all these people are going to live a normal life expectancy. One of the things that I see oftentimes in the comments is that somebody would get diagnosed with prostate cancer. Typically they're told it's like stage three, stage four, and then the doctor will give them a timeline and they'll say you have probably this many years to live and this is how long we can keep you. And it still surprises me that I see that considering how effective treatments are nowadays, especially with, you know, you have triple therapies. There's all sorts of situations for the various types of prostate cancer and the various situations that the patient has when it comes to their extent of their disease. Why do you think we're still seeing these timelines given and should a patient ever take them seriously? Doctors, when confronted with really what are intimidating situations, metastatic cancer, that uh, sometimes we feel impotent. And one thing we are armed with is a little bit of information where we can provide a prognosis and say, well, in my professional opinion, this appears to be serious and you have such and such amount of time before uh, we're going to be getting into trouble. That is uh, just a, a problem with fighting cancer. I mean, we have limited tools and, and with most other cancers besides prostate cancer, many times they end up losing the battle. There's also an ignorance factor because prostate cancer is just one of over 100 cancers that general medical oncologists treat. It's hard to be intimately familiar with all the cancers and up to date with all the latest thinking. So sometimes there's you know, just uh, a knowledge deficit. Because hormone treatment is so powerful, you need to be humble enough to tell patients, wait about four to six months while we see how this treatment works. It's well established in the literature, but again, not widely known that what is called the PSA nadir, that is how low the PSA drops after four to six months of initial treatment, is far and away the best way to know what the future is gonna bring. And a doctor who is making pronouncements prior to observing the response to treatment after four to six months is really just unfortunately ignorant. They do not understand prostate cancer. They're probably treating 100 different cancers and, and uh, they're not familiar with this particular prognostic factor called the PSA nadir. The PSA nadir, when the PSA drops below 0.1 within six months of initiating treatment, the 10-year survival rates are north of 85 to 90%. These people do extremely well because they have a genre of prostate cancer that is sensitive to hormone deprivation 
And hormone deprivation is very, very effective. It can continue responding for years and years and years. We want to identify the people who aren't responding to hormone deprivation, and that'll occur within the first two, three, or four months. If someone's starting with a PSA of 150, and the PSA declines all the way down to six, people are rejoicing because, wow, that's more than a 97% response. But what they're forgetting is that that last six, that small amount of cancer that isn't being harmed by the, by the hormone therapy because it's continuing to make PSA, that means the cancer is still viable, is still alive, in the face of our very best treatment, that is going to uh, be the character of the cancer going forward. So that uninhibited, that small amount of residual uninhibited cancer is what's going to start growing and it will not be controllable with hormone therapy. And so now you're on to chemotherapy or lutetium or immune therapies, which have some benefit, but nowhere near the hope of decade remissions that we sometimes see with hormone therapy. These uh, pronouncements that physicians are making, unfortunately, I think it's just an uh, ignorant uh, viewpoint that is offered because they're supposed to have an answer, but they don't really understand how prostate cancer is, uh, is functioning in relationship to this hormonal treatment that is potentially so powerful. I appreciate the way you contextualize that because I think on the channel a lot of times, especially reading it in the comment section, you can see that men are adamantly against hormone therapy from the get-go, but I don't think they understand how powerful it is against prostate cancer. And yes, the side effects are devastating, they can be debilitating, but the fact that it has that anti-cancer effect to that extent over that amount of time is really powerful. And so I appreciate the, the context of that. Another question we get oftentimes is, you know, you mentioned, we talked about 80 plus METs in a patient and having extended, you know, metastatic activity. Then we talked about localized disease, but patients are often wondering when it comes to lymph node invasion, is there a point where the survival rates would change based on how many lymph nodes have metast you know, have metastases, or is it really that when it gets into the bones and further into the body that the rates would change? Well, there's sort of a stepwise prognostic ladder in men that have no spread at all men who have spread only to lymph nodes, men who have spread to lymph nodes and to bones, and then beyond that, fairly rare situation where people would have spread even to the liver. So those are progressively more serious, but it's much better to have a hormone-sensitive disease in the liver than a hormone-insensitive disease in the lymph nodes. Now, sometimes you can sterilize the lymph nodes with radiation, but if your best treatment isn't working, hormone therapy being the best treatment, then that is a very serious situation. It's more serious than having disease that spread because the beauty of hormone treatment is that it works throughout the whole body. And even when cancer is spread, men can go into complete remissions with hormone therapy. You mentioned prostate cancer going to the liver. What type of situations, like have you seen patients, you know, go into remissions or be cured even when they have metastases in the liver? Well, they certainly can go into durable remissions. I would say 20, 25 years ago, before we had uh, Taxotair, we would usually see spread to the liver in people that had already become hormone resistant. It was sort of an end stage development. Taxotair came along and we were seeing some notable remissions. The advent now of spot radiation, uh, injection of radiation to the liver called stir spheres, lutetium, and more importantly, I think just better staging with PSMA PET scan. So if someone finds a little tiny spot in the liver with a PSMA PET scan, that doesn't have the same implications. In the old days, these things were you know, large tumors uh, in end-stage prostate cancer. So people who have liver metastasis certainly can be treated, can go into a complete remission, and can live quite a while now years, even though they've had liver metastasis. Let's say that somebody walks in to your office and they have a localized, like Gleason 7, 8, even 9, and they have not had treatment before, and they still have all these treatments ahead of them. We, are, we, ha we have hormone therapies, we have chemotherapies, we have pluvicto, lutetium, there's um, just so many treatments ahead of them. And when I was earlier in my prostate career, I was always learning about sequencing, you know, which treatments do you do first and in what order and then getting into the combinations of them. As far as that goes, as far as the sequencing of all these treatments, you know, we talk about prostate cancer sometimes as a chronic disease because um, even though it's cancer and people can kind of get frustrated with that language, it's because there are so many treatments and you're really dealing with going in remission and coming back, dealing with it again. So what type of timeline do you see a patient 
who typically is in that localized state with all those treatments ahead of them, are we looking at 25 years typically? How does it average and change based off the patient's Gleason score? What's that timeline and that length that we can look forward to? So you need 20, 25 years experience to be able to answer that question. We have that in prostate cancer. The problem is, is that the people that are running into difficulty now 25 years later, they were diagnosed back in the 1990s. They had local disease and maybe, you know, 15 years ago they developed metastatic disease and they've been fighting and whatnot. And now in 2024, you know, 20 plus years later, they, um, uh, they seem to be running out of options. The problem with uh, trying to equate that to modern times is that we know so much more about prostate cancer now and we have such better treatments uh, than we had back then. The old policy of, we'll try this, if that doesn't work, we'll try that, if that doesn't work, we'll try this, if that doesn't work, we'll try that, is no longer state of the art. That's the old fashioned way of doing things. So now we have so much information about what people have at the get go in terms of their genetics and, and we can project whether this person's on a track towards problems and this person's not on a track towards problems. Persons that are on a track towards problems they don't get this sequential one thing at a time. They, they, we, we swing for the fence. You'll get two or three treatments simultaneously to eradicate it, and then they'll be watched very closely, and if the first sign of any new problem, then they'll get another uh, intense treatment. And that's gonna work so much better. And this is why I think that many of the people that we see that ha are now 20 years down the line and maybe facing mortality, maybe they're diagnosed at age 60 and now they're in their early 80s and we're running out of options and they may die next year from prostate cancer. I don't know if that's going to be true for people that are di diagnosed in 2024. Over a 20 year time period, which is what we were able to achieve with old fashioned methodologies, modern medicine applied to people who are diagnosed at a timely fashion, uh, they're getting their PSAs checked every year. The likelihood of, of someone like myself dying of prostate cancer with a new diagnosis of prostate cancer properly managed with state-of-the-art methods seems almost close to zero. There are a couple key points that Dr. Scholz made in this video that I think are really important. Number one, it is so good to know your own personal prostate cancer. You should know your PSA levels. You should know what your Gleason score is. You should get your imaging reports so that you know where your cancer is and how it's being dealt with. The more information you know, the more you can customize your care. And when I say customize your care, there are a lot of things in prostate cancer that are little nuances that people don't often think about. If you're having a hard time tolerating a medication, sometimes you can talk to your doctor about dosage or switching a medication. If you're dealing with side effects, you can talk to you know your doctor about how do I mitigate these side effects? If it's hot flashes, can I take an estrogen patch? If I'm dealing with fatigue, is there something that I can do like weightlifting? And all of these little things, these little tweaks can help quality of life over time. It's important that when you learn your own personal case, you can also learn about options for you in the future. You know, there's a lot in clinical trials that we're seeing come down the pipeline, whether it's PARP inhibitors, whether it's actinium, there's just different things things that we're seeing that hopefully in the next couple years will get approved in prostate cancer. So when we talk about prostate cancer being more like a chronic disease, it's not to belittle it in any way. Obviously it's cancer and you're dealing with the side effects and you are controlling it. But it is to say that there are certain things coming down in the pipeline and you're going to be grandfathered into better and better treatments over time, especially as we're starting to see genetic testing and biomarkers and all sorts of things come out. There's different assays you can even take in order to see if you have certain side effects for certain treatments or if that would happen to you based based off of your genetics. All of this is a moment where we can say, hey, these are really great things that are happening in the world of prostate cancer. There is a lot of hope. If you're newly diagnosed, there's already a lot of treatments on the market, but there's also a lot coming. So subscribe to our channel because you can stay updated on all that's happening in prostate cancer. When new things come you know, and are approved by the FDA, we do videos on them. It's just a great way to stay up to date. Get into support groups because it's also a great way to learn about, hey, he had this treatment. This is how it affected him. This is, you know, oh, I didn't even know you could do this for the side effect. Staying in touch with other prostate cancer patients is a great way to help manage your disease. But I would really encourage you, it's not just not to do it alone, but it's to take care of yourself from a mental health standpoint, an emotional standpoint, and just a knowledge standpoint so that you can walk into your doctor's offices feeling confident that your questions are going to be answered and that you have different people on your team that are going to help you get through this. Also, you can reach out to our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline because they're prostate cancer patients who have been through this journey. They have a wealth of information and it's just a great way to learn about your own personal case. Please remember, you're not alone, and I hope you have a great week.